Good morning, all. It's great to see so many of you joining us already. We're going to start in just a few moments time once everyone has had a chance to get in and get settled before kickoff at 9.30. Great to have you with us. Good morning again. I can still see that there are large numbers joining us. So we're just going to hold off for another few moments just to let everyone get in and get settled and ready for today's session. Thank you. Okay, good morning. A very warm welcome to you all this morning on this, the first session of Intertrade Ireland's COVID-19 uh, webinar series. Today, we're going to be looking at the topic of financial supports for businesses in Northern Ireland. But before I hand over to Shane O'Hanlon from Intertrade Ireland to formally open the event and introduce our speakers and our panelists, just a few points on Zoom for those who are joining their first webinar. There will be an opportunity for Q&A with our speakers. Uh, so if you have any questions for our experts, please go ahead and submit these in the Q&A box that you will see at the bottom of your screen. This can be done at any stage throughout the presentation, but I would ask that perhaps you hold off questions about the job retention scheme until after Rosemary Connolly has come to speak to us. Then when it comes to the Q&A at a section after each presentation, just to help with uh, the administration of such a large audience that's joining us today, I will call out your name and ask you to raise your hand. Again, this can be found at the bottom of your screen, at which stage I will enable your mic and uh, put the floor over to you to ask your question directly to our panel. 
Your experience today uh, as a webinar attendee is very similar to any virtual meeting that you will have attended. You can interact with us, as I've explained, uh, via um, the Q&A and via raising your hand, but we're also going to be issuing polls uh, throughout the event. This will help our speakers gauge uh, your current position and the need of those joining us today. These will just pop up onto your screen as and when they go live. The only difference about a webinar is that we can't see you uh, and we can't hear you until I enable your mic uh, individually in the Q&A section. So hopefully that will provide you some clarity uh, and help with a really interactive session today. So without further ado, I am going to hand over the floor to Shane. I'm going to invite him to come on camera and come on mic. And as he does, I really hope that this live session is of help to you and your business uh, at these really difficult times. So thank you, Shane, over to you. Thank you, Caroline, thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, for logging on this morning uh, to what is the first uh, in a series of six webinars um, delivered uh, by Intertrade Ireland to help businesses navigate their way through the key supports that have been put in place in both jurisdictions in response to COVID-19. Businesses are telling us uh, that they very much welcome the range of available supports, but need guidance to decipher what is suitable to them and what they're eligible to apply for and very importantly, to keep them updated on changes as they happen. We hope this interactive webinar will prove helpful. As Caroline says, this morning's session will focus on the financial supports that have been put in place to assist businesses in Northern Ireland. Before we get started, I'd like to take a very quick opportunity to bring to your attention some of the supports that Intertrade Ireland have recently put in place to assist businesses during these uncertain times. Firstly, eMERGE. Emerge offers up to £2,500 fully funded consultancy support and advice to help your business develop online sales and e-commerce solutions. Secondly, Emergency Business Solutions offers up to £2,000 fully funded consultancy support and advice to address key business challenges, including cash flow, HR issues and supply chain issues, and many more. Eligibility criteria for both these programmes are very simply that the company is a manufacturing or tradable service business registered on the island, has a satisfactory trading history, is engaged in cross-border trade, and has the capacity to deliver on the project over the next number of weeks. And finally, is an SME, i.e. less than 250 employees, a turnover less than 40 million. Additionally, Intertrade Ireland have produced two excellent resource documents that are very much complementary to this morning's session one specific to Northern Ireland and the second to Ireland. These are available on our website and they summarise the key information you and your business needs to know. Finally, alongside TAC Ireland, Intertrade Ireland have helped create an online platform in the form of an interactive map, which allows businesses, allows businesses to see who they can work with to combat the many supply chain and manufacturing challenges generated by the pandemic. pandemic. With all these supports, I'd encourage you to look at our website, intertradeireland.com. So before I hand you over to Fergal, I'd like to say a few thank yous. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Rosemary Conley of Rosemary Conley Solicitors for giving up her time this morning to be with us. It's greatly appreciated. And also to Fergal and his team at PKF FPM, most notably Michelle and Caroline for putting these webinars together for us. So that's enough for me and I'll hand you over to Fergal. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as Shane said, my name is Fergal McCormick. I'm the Managing Director of PKF FPM Accountants, and I'm delighted to share with you in the presentation this morning an overview of the COVID-19 financial supports available to businesses operating here in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> I'm uh, delighted also to be joined by my colleagues Michelle Hawkins and Amy McShane, who will participate in the panel discussions. 
in terms of my slides, to be honest with you, I plan to use them more as an aid memoir, not to go into each slide in, in detail. Uh, we're fortunate, as Shane has already referred to the fact, they were joined later on by leading Northern Ireland employment lawyer, Rosemary Connolly. And in particular, Rosemary will take us through uh, many of the, the legal intricacies uh, of the coronavirus job retention scheme. And therefore, uh, I won't go into that in, in the same detail. Also, as both Caroline and Shane have said, we're really keen to encourage active participation and facilitation in this morning's webinar. And for that reason, we've included uh, six poll questions, but more importantly, we really would welcome your questions. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's, let's test uh, your participation. We're gonna start off with the first poll question. Very simply, the question is, uh, have you had to cease all or part of your operations to date? And if you would simply uh, respond yes or no, and we'll give you the results very shortly. So there you can see 71% yes, 29% uh, no. So we'll, we'll move on if you don't mind. And uh, basically the, the, the first grant that became available was the 10,000 pound small business grant. And basically this was uh, initially uh, available only to businesses in, rece in receipt of the Small Business uh, Rate Relief Green, the SBRR. Uh, however, it was then expanded to, to include those who also benefited from uh, industrial derating. Now you may ask, what is the net annual value? Well, the net annual value appears on page two of your annual rates bill. And basically it's what you would expect to achieve if your property was leased. And that's the basis upon which both the 10,000 and the 25,000 grants uh, were based. Now, just in that context, uh, the government has been uh, flexible in that, for example, uh, a low, uh, Leave 2020 came in in April and the 1st of April, uh, irrespective of whether you are uh, under 15 below uh, before the 1st of April or after the 1st of April, whichever is more beneficial, the government will accept in terms of this £10,000 loan. Now, it's fair to say that already 21,000 businesses have received uh, the £10,000 loan and you should have if you haven't, if you pay by direct debit and you haven't received the grant, well, you need to follow that up very quickly, and uh, you do that by contacting the Department for the Economy. It's important to appreciate that businesses with three or less premises will only be eligible for one uh, grant in respect of the ten thousand, and be conscious that the closing date for this scheme is the twentieth of May. Um, now, as a result of a lot of lobbying, uh, uh, basically the government then extended <clears throat> the £10,000 loan to cover uh, rental properties and properties with a total net annual value of less than £1,590. And basically, <clears throat> although the current legislation stipulates that in respect of a non-domestic uh, rental property with a total NAV of one two or below, the landlord is liable for the rates. What the government did in this scheme is they said to ensure that all small businesses which occupy the property benefits from the grant. They said you didn't need to be the landlord or the agent to benefit. However, in order to be eligible for it, your business had to be the sole tenant of the rental property. Uh, and whether the landlord received the rates or you received them. Now, <clears throat> it's actually to, to explain this further, it's, good, it's useful to use a, a very simple example uh, to show where actually you have to be careful whether you're eligible or not. Take, for example, a hairdresser who rents a space in the hotel and pays rents and rates to the landlord. If you think about it, in this case, the hotel just gets one rates bill. Uh, the hairdresser specific area within the hotel is not separated for the purposes of the rate bill. And therefore, because she's deemed a shared tenant and not a separate rates bill, and, not, and there is no separate rates bill issued to the landlord in respect of the area she's using, then basically she is not eligible uh, for the 10,000 pound grant. Moving on then to the larger grant, which is a £25,000 grant, which is specific to businesses operating in the retail, uh, hospitality, tourism and leisure uh, sectors. It, this is really eligible for businesses who have a net annual value from their rates bill of between 15000 and 25000 Now, unlike the £10,000 grant, this is not automatic and you do have to apply for it. 
And it's fair to say that um, at present, about two and a half thousand businesses in Northern Ireland have actually applied for this. Now, if you receive the £10,000 grant, but you have an additional property which meets the £25,000 criteria, believe it or not, you are eligible for also for the £25,000 grant, so you should make an application. Again, the closing date is the 20th of May. Now, just to check out how you've got on with the, those 10,000 or 25,000 pound grants, can we ask you a question? Have you been able to access the cash grants? And if so, if you could reply yes or no, please. Well, I think that reads pretty well because <clears throat> what it shows is there is a level of, of, of buy-in to the grant scheme, albeit uh, only 44% have said yes. But the key point there is many people on, on the webinar may not have been eligible in the first place, but I'm sure uh, there will be some interest in that poll. Uh, so basically moving on then, uh, uh, as it was well publicized a few, a few weeks ago, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive brought in a, a, a rate-free holiday for all business rate players, which will cover the months of April, May, and June 2020. And in reality, this is a 25% reduction on your annual rates. Uh, the amount does not need to be repaid, as I said, as a grant, it's not a loan. Uh, and it means that rates bills will not be issued until June 2020. And it's supplied automatically if you, if you pay by direct debit. Now, in addition, you may have noticed that uh, in, the, in the Northern Ireland budget, which virtually went unnoticed because of COVID-19, there actually was a further reduction in the Northern Ireland regional rate by 12.5%. And the net effect of this is that we expect your rates uh, for next year, for the current year now, uh, to fall by uh, 18%, non domestic rates. Now, also, uh, HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, uh, in order to help cash flow, uh, introduced a, a deferral of VAT, uh, saying that you didn't have to pick your VAT payments for the months of February, March, and April until the end of June 2020. Now, in reality, what this means is for those periods, February, March and April, uh, the, the payment has been deferred to 2021. Equally, uh, the revenue authorities have set up a helpline to help those who are unable to pay their taxes due to COVID-19. And specifically, they'll agree quite often, we're finding actually very favorably, they'll agree installment arrangements. They'll also suspend debt collection procedures and they're canceling penalties interest where these were due uh, to COVID-19. Uh, a lot, a number of businesses are delighted that they've also decided to give a one-year extension to the introduction of the much publicised over the last couple of years, making tax digital systems that people, businesses were required to put in to facilitate uh, their, their VAT returns. And this, this VAT soft landing will mean that businesses now have until their VAT return starting on or off the 1st of April 2021 to put in place uh, uh, their digital links. Very significantly, uh, they've also switched resources within the revenue so they can make tax repayments more quickly to help businesses struggling in the face of COVID-19. Now, as many of you, I suspect, are aware, one of the biggest sources of tax repayments is claims for R&D tax credits. And this applies to all sides of businesses. So therefore, if you think you have an R&D tax credit claim, you should bring it forward from a cash flow perspective. But also very interesting in the financial media today in London, uh, they're highlighting that the revenue are looking at uh, substandard R&D claims in particular, and that they, they, are, they are believe there's a few rogue people in this area. So be very careful uh, who you use to do your R&D tax credit schemes. I mentioned earlier that Rosemary Conley was going to talk in detail about the, the coronavirus job retention scheme, CJRS as it's known. So therefore, I'm just going to talk, cover it very briefly and leave a lot of the detail to Rosemary. Suffice to say that the purpose of the scheme was to support employee uh, retention through furlough, and the support has now been extended for a further month until the 30th of June. So it's covering now the period 1 March to the 30th of June, and it covers 80% of your gross wage plus employers NIC and the pension of employees. 
And as I think uh, it's well covered now, uh, those who are furloughed uh, cannot work in their existing company. They may volunteer to work on others. So we're going to move on maybe again just to get a feel for the participation in the furlough scheme to ask you to participate in a further poll. Uh, and I must say the one thing that's very encouraging here is a massive participation. Uh, we're getting a participation rate in these polls of those in, in the webinar of 99%, which is fantastic. So what percentage of your staff, if any, have you furloughed at present? Or as the French would say, I think furloughed at present. It's a little bit more complicated question here. You see, it's not a yes or no. You have to tick the percentage. But I think, Caroline, we'll, rather than, we, we'll run with the answers there. And uh, yeah, pretty good, pretty good, as you can see. Uh, the, the response is on your screen there. Uh, a, fair bit of, um, a fair bit of participation. The furlough scheme is important. Uh, and that's, again, good feedback. But equally, there's quite a high number of people yet have not benefited from it. So. Uh, uh, I think there's some things there for thought. So in terms of the coronavirus job retention scheme, I'm not going to go into this in detail because I said Rosemary is going to do that. Just uh, <clears throat> to, to point, highlight the three week consecutive period that you need a minimum of three weeks of your furloughing people, you can then bring them back in again. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's not necessary to furlough all your staff. Uh, Rosemary will cover uh, the whole area of second jobs. Uh, one, two points I would like to highlight, however, which is very, these were further clarifications and further extension, extending of the scheme as it went along. Directors of limited companies, director's salary, uh, as many will know, can be a combination of both dividends and salary via POE. Now, the salary through the POE system is now eligible for support under the job retention scheme at 80% of gross salary, up to, again, the maximum of 2,500. Uh, if the director was on the POE scheme, However, the balance of income extracted via dividends is not supported. Um, uh, so that's an important point. Now, what, what, the, what, what, what the interpretation is, by the way, that although you're not allowed to work under the furlough scheme, if you're a director, you can deal with the normal legal requirements of a director. And the other significant uh, extension to the scheme related to people who are called IR35 contractors, and I'm conscious from the webinar participation list that a number of you are fall into this category. And these people are basically people who work for the public sector uh, through personal service companies who are unable to carry out work due to the COVID-19 restrictions or are doing specific IT uh, projects, uh, strategic projects. And believe it or not, although they're technically speaking, uh, may be deemed as self-employed in some instances, they are allowed to, to claim under the, the coronavirus scheme. What Rose is going to, going to deal with on retaining of staff. And just finally, to, to clarify how you actually make the claim. Um, basically, uh, HMRC are now running a number of webinars, and they're very good, actually. You should feel free to go on to them on how to actually uh, register for and operate the, 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 the job retention scheme. Payment in respect of the, 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 the claims is, should be received six days after an application. Uh, I must say we did find that happened uh, this month in, in terms of March. And to receive payment prior to the end of May 2020, you will have to have submitted your claim before the 22nd of May. So there you go. Uh, claims can be made equally 14 days in advance. So they're all quite important. And it's important to realize you've got to do your claim in one session very important and it's also important to realize that the revenue will be uh, doing due diligence on your claim uh, afterwards and uh, yeah, you'll get the odd phone call if you get it wrong. Moving on then very importantly to the self-employment income support scheme and you may remember when the original uh, job retention scheme was announced there was a lot of controversy that the self-employed were not being helped. So this was the scheme that was, a bit, was then brought out. And uh, what it does is it allows self-employed individuals or members of partnerships to claim a taxable grant worth 80% of their trading profits up to a maximum of 2,500 per month. Now, to be eligible, you have to be self-employed or, or a partnership. You must have submitted your income tax return for the tax year 2018 and traded in the tax year 2019. Uh, you must intend to continue to trade in 2021, albeit you may not be trading now because of COVID-19. And uh, 
you know, th th this is quite significant. And what you happen is a number of people perhaps hadn't done their returns and they did extend the period upon which you could actually submit your, your returns. And, and equally, if you're not self-employed in the 2018-2019 tax year and did not submit a 2018-2019 tax return, then you're not eligible for this scheme. Now, unlike the job retention scheme, very importantly to appreciate that actually you can continue to work uh, as self-employed. Now, there's a couple of things to work out in your own mind uh, how you actually, how much you think you'll get under the scheme. In very simple terms, there's an averaging in the last three years, averaging your last three tax returns. So say, for example, you, you, you earn, say, 10,000, 12,000, and 14,000 average over the last three years, then that's 36,000. You divide by three, that gives you 12. And basically, you're entitled uh, to, uh, to 80%, which is 800 pound a month, because you're well under the, the cap of 2,500. Um, if you haven't submitted tax returns for all three years, HMRC will work out the average trading profit. Now, that's only if you hadn't started in the very first year. Um, it's important to appreciate in, in this particular scheme, HMRC will contact you. And uh, if they haven't contacted you, they're starting to contact from the 4th of May, and they have an online service available from the 13th of May. Now, the, the plan is that those eligible will have the money paid in one lump sum into their bank account by the 25th of May, or alternatively, depending on when you submit it, within six working days of your claim. Now, a really important point to note here is that self-employed persons cannot uh, ask their accountant or agent to process this. They must do it themselves. And what this means is you must have a government gateway user ID and password. Now, we have found that has tripped a few people up. So uh, that can take you a few days to get. And the reason that is, is believe it or not, you technically speaking don't calculate anything. All you do is register. The revenue already have the information from your tax returns and they calculate it. Now, it's also fair to play that, say that self-employed people were particularly hardly hit uh, during COVID-19. And there were a few other things there that they could do in the interim. For example, uh, they, could have make a, they could make a claim on the universal uh, credit. And obviously, again, the amount you're eligible for depends on household income and savings. And there was an extension to the scheme as well, which we'll cover briefly later. Uh, the revenue also gave a concession that self-assessment income payments, which normally are due uh, the 31st of July 2020, have been deferred for six months uh, to the 31st of January 2021. And obviously, uh, self-employed uh, people with back business, with bank accounts, etc., can benefit from some of the, the loan schemes that we'll talk about shortly. Now, I'm very conscious that uh, on our next seminar on the 15th of May, and we hope Friday the 15th of May, we hope you all join us. We will actually be talking in more detail on cash flow management and funding. And therefore, I don't plan to go into the Corona uh, Business Interruption Loan Scheme in much detail. But to be honest with you, you can't look at the context of supports available uh, to non iron businesses without referring to it. And basically, this scheme was targeted at small and medium-sized businesses with access uh, to loans, providing them on overdrafts, invoice finance, or indeed asset finance, up to £5 million for six, six years. And basically, the government is providing the lender with an 80% back guarantee, and more importantly, and very interestingly, uh, 12 months uh, interest-free. Now, the, the scheme came in for a lot of criticism at the start, because what was happening was, funders were saying, if you had the capacity to take out normal lending, then they weren't allowing you access to the scheme. So the government stepped in again, and what they've now done is they've said, that those who are eligible to secure additional finance under normal terms are now eligible to apply for the scheme. So the funder can't try and say, oh no, you're not eligible for the scheme because you can get money anyway. No, you are eligible. Secondly, very significantly, personal guarantees were, were removed uh, for facilities under 250,000. And personal guarantees can be applied over the 250,000 uh, facility. Uh, maybe, uh, I've seen quite a few that haven't been, but maybe. And thankfully, uh, a further uh, concession is that the principal private residence, your, your principal private residence, cannot be taken as security or a personal guarantee under the scheme. Now, there's 23 providers operating in Northern Ireland, and uh, the good news is that AIB, which wasn't originally included in the, the 22, has been added on the 27th of April. Again, typically we're finding that the minimum loan under the scheme is about £25,000. Um, it's fair to say that, being realistic, the banks or the funders are looking for you to demonstrate, number one, that your business would be viable 
uh, and was viable before COVID. Number two, it has the ability post COVID to hopefully be a sustainable business and be able to repay. And there, because this is a loan, remember. And therefore, the key point here is you will have to demonstrate through cash flow forecasts, etc., uh, that your your ability to be sustainable back in the long, whatever your re-engineered business future is in terms of your assumptions. Now, uh, the bounce back loan scheme was introduced very recently on the 27th of April, and this was really a fast track scheme designed to help small and medium sized businesses. Now, per again, I think the Financial Times this morning, they're saying there was a massive surge yesterday, believe it or not. Yesterday morning between nine and 12, it was the, the largest, I think it was 10 times fold, 10 fold increase in the applications during that three hour period. Now this covers loans between two to 50,000 uh, pounds, up to a maximum of 25% of turnover. And the more significant point here is that the government will guarantee 100% of the loan to the financial institution and there's no repayments interest or capital uh, during the first 12 months to be eligible businesses must be based uh, in northern ireland or the uk they must have been negatively affected by COVID 19 and uh, by the way if you received interestingly if you receive support under the corona business interruption loan scheme you cannot apply for the the bounce back loan scheme however if your loan under the CBILS scheme was less than 50,000, you can apply to actually get it transferred over to the bounce back loan scheme and it would be preferential to do that. This scheme opens for applications uh, from the 4th of May past there. And this brings us on then in terms of our next question because obviously to make applications uh, for the bank finance from fun or for fund other asset funders, uh, you had to prepare, in our experience, emergency cash flow forecast as a minimum, and in many cases, a business continuity plan. So we'd like to ask you, the fourth question is, uh, have you prepared a cash flow or a business continuity plan? Interestingly, 54% have said yes, and uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 54%. I, I would have thought that figure would have been higher, but again, uh, I think it's 54% of those people in the webinar, as opposed to 54% of those who actually made known applications. And then, just to make sure you're you're still with us, we have another question for you, and uh, uh, I think this probably. We should have maybe asked it the other way around because it would have given us the exact answer on the previous one. But have you accessed bank finance before as part of the COVID-19 uh, scheme? Have you operated them? And you can see there we have 23% uh, are saying uh, yes. So again, Quite a high pickup, and uh, that then puts in context our previous answer, which then is very high because if 23% have said yes, and if that 23%, 54% are saying they prepared cash flow forecasts, that's very encouraging. Okay, so we move on. Um, although Invest and I don't have any specific COVID-19 uh, programs, what they have done is they're encouraging all their, their, their client companies to avail of their existing programs. And they're certainly very, very flexible in terms of making those programs available, particularly for businesses who are now starting to go into phase two to start planning their re-engineering of their business. Uh, you know, where now, where do they want to be? And more importantly, how do they plan to recover uh, post COVID-19 because thankfully the World Health Organization is saying that COVID-19 will be tampering and again the, the best way to, to check that out is to co contact your Invest NI client executive or to go to the Northern Ireland uh, business information businessinfo.co.uk or the free uh, help uh, telephone number which I'm sure many of you are familiar now, I'm not going to, Shane, Shane covered this uh, excellently earlier on, so I'm not going to go into the Interstate Ireland Emergency Business Support. Suffice to say, I think the most important thing here is that Interstate Ireland continues to be very proactive to promote the island economy. And the key point that Shane made was that they extended the scheme from originally uh, only those involved in Interstate Ireland programs to any business, uh, obviously manufacturing and creative services based on the island of Ireland. 
In terms of other specific sector supports, yes, there are. There have been other specific sector supports. Um, for example, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive came in with a 1.5 million uh, scheme for the fishing industry. Uh, the charity sector is able to benefit from a number of schemes, including the community uh, charity fund. Uh, the community sector, uh, 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 the community sector again, there are specific. Uh, schemes targeted purely at the community sector, uh, but but reasonably small amounts. Sp there's a hardship uh, COVID-19 uh, assistance program brought in for sporting organisations. Uh, tourism and I actually are very proactive. Um, God help you, anybody that are glutton for punishment, you might even see yours truly doing a webinar this afternoon for them, uh, two o'clock. But they basically are obviously the tourism and hospitality sector is a sector very hardly, very, very very hard hit by COVID-19. I mean, currently employing in Northern Ireland over 65,000 people and generating 1.9 billion uh, to the Northern Ireland economy. And finally, last night late, uh, the Hardship Fund was announced. Now, uh, det further details are going to be given next week, but the reality is this is targeted business who didn't qualify initially for the 10 or the 25,000 pound grants, which employ less than 10 people. And uh, it's a welcome. It's believed there'll be about 8,000 organizations will become uh, applicable for this grant, and it will include social enterprises and charities. Just broadly, before we conclude, a couple of very quick points on other supports out there. Uh, you should be aware that there's been a three months extension given to the filing of accounts. Uh, also, I uh, hope it doesn't affect you, but uh, Companies House will temporarily pause the strike off process of companies in order to try and prevent companies being dissolved. Uh, late penalty fees are being looked at very favourably and sympathetically if it happens to be due to COVID-19. And again, uh, I think, uh, and, and we're finding most companies and certainly uh, not-for-profit organisations are proceeding with their AGMs and there is new flexible arrangements in, in, to facilitate that and also allowing organisations to proceed with virtual uh, AGMs. Obviously, a very significant support to, to many of us personally is that most mortgage lenders have agreed that they would support customers to a minimum of a three month holiday period. Indeed, uh, and also uh, most uh, asset finance providers, HP providers, some I'm aware of, for example, have extended that to six months. We talked about earlier about the universal credit scheme, and thankfully that allowance has been increased by a thousand pounds over 12 months. So, I think the key question that we're all finding very hard to exactly answer at present, but in, in broad terms, do you expect your turnover to fall over the next 12 months? And if so, if you could uh, go through the broad uh, percentages and tick whichever one you think is most applicable to your business. Interesting. I think uh, the, the high percentages are coming in there, 20 to 30 and 30 to 40, I think. So again, interesting that, that most people, I think, and that is the common perception because nobody really knows in the current extraordinary uncertain times we're trading, but that is what people are really budgeting for. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions on both sides. There's some businesses that are even not very busy, busier than they've ever been at present, particularly those servicing the healthcare sector, etc., cetera, uh, and some uh, food businesses but as a rule of thumb most businesses we are experiencing are working on the assumption that turnover will fall 20 to 30 percent unfortunately there are others because of the, the complete collapse in their sector uh, have had to assume a, a lot bigger figure uh, that's all really i had planned to to cover as an overview uh, i'm more than willing now to go back to caroline who i think is going to facilitate a, a question and answer session and i hope my colleagues uh, michelle and Eva, you know, I've got their pencils sharp and they're raring to answer. So thank you for your questions. Uh, we are going to pause there and hand over to Rosemary. Uh, the panelists are going to come off camera and come off mic bar Rosemary, who is going to share her presentation with you. And while she does that, she is, as you've heard, going to talk to us about the job retention scheme, something that's getting a lot of press at the moment. So. Rosemary, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and can I say at the outset that I'm very pleased to be uh, invited to join the webinar today. Um, 
by Intertrade Ireland and by Fergal uh, and the team at FPM. Um, I um, have been asked to and will now speak about the coronavirus job retention scheme, uh, which um, you will have heard a lot about uh, in recent weeks. Um, the scheme was announced by the Chancellor on the 20th of March. And essentially, it is a scheme um, which is aimed at retaining in employment individuals who might otherwise have been made redundant or placed on temporary cessation. Now, the, um, the, the scheme introduced um, a concept not terribly well known in, in, in this jurisdiction and certainly a new one for employment lawyers, um, uh, namely a furlough scheme. And um, the, the scheme, the, the, the term furlough, new as it is to all of us, essentially uh, means that an individual has been placed on a, at, at home, required to stay at home, and asked to cease all work. However, uh, the other aspect of the scheme, which it is very important to be aware of, is that it is essentially a grant scheme. Um, and therefore, it is an employment support to employers to retain in, empl in employment individuals who might otherwise have, have been at risk of having their employment terminated. Therefore, uh, it's important to remember that it doesn't amend any aspect of employment law as such, um, but it sits more within the context of a grant. Now, which, employ a, which um, employers are covered? All employers are covered, large, small, and in between. And that includes charities, recruitment agencies, public authorities, uh, to a limited extent. And which employees are covered? Well, all employees are covered provided they feature in, in the employer's PAYE claim. That's the important eligibility criterion. The, 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 the scheme itself extends to full-time employees, part-time employees, temporary, casual, so-called zero hours uh, employees uh, and agency workers. I suppose the difficulty that has been identified, one of the difficulties that has been identified in relation to zero hours employees is that because an employer gets to determine how many hours a zero hours employee works, there is the possibility that those persons might not be provided with any work, rather uh, as an alternative to being placed on the furlough scheme. Apologies to all uh, participants. That shows you, you know, employment lawyers are, you, you, you know, are, are not technocrats by any manner of means. Apologies about that. I, I hope uh, that everyone was clear that uh, basically the the um, the message is that uh, you know a large range of employees and and, and indeed those also termed workers are covered by the scheme, but there can be some complexities in, in the, uh, I'm speaking about the, the situation pertaining to zero hours employees in particular. Now, that having been said, I think the aim of the scheme was that, um, uh, and this carries through in terms of, of payment uh, claims on behalf of zero hours workers stroke employees, is that one should look at what individuals normally earned uh, and by definition, the, the hours that they normally engaged in, in terms of deciding what, what, what they should get under the scheme. So, um, uh, what is covered? Well, Fergal's already covered this in, in some detail, and, and we're aware that it's the lower of 80% of an employee's regular wage or, or, or £2,500 per month. Um, and I won't dwell too much on the, on the detail of that, but only to say, as Fergal has pointed out, that it includes also employers, national insurance contributions and pension contributions paid uh, on the subsidised furlough pay, that is the 80% for, for a lot of people, up to the minimum of the uh, automatic enrolment employer contributions. 
So um, how should an employer decide who to furlough? Now, this is a really important consideration, bearing in mind, as I've said, that the scheme is essentially a grant scheme. It doesn't alter individuals' entitlements in employment law, neither their contractual employment rights nor their statutory employment rights. Uh, in some instances, it may be reasonably straightforward. There may be the, 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 the entire workforce may uh, be uh, in contemplation to be placed on furlough, or there may be specific departments where work has effectively um, ground to a halt and, and all persons in those departments would be designated uh, as furloughed. However, where choices have to be made, where there's a reduction in work, but uh, it's a question of determining which among a group of employees should be furloughed, very, very, very important to ensure that fair, objective, and crucially non-discriminatory criteria are used. Um, to that extent, many employers are looking at the considerations that normally enter into the reckoning in determining who should be made redundant so that, uh, so that they can be clear that they are applying consistent, fair and objective criteria. New paragraph. So it's a, one of the things that's entirely legitimate to bring into a consideration is business needs and also, as I've just said, availability of, of types of work. It's also entirely legitimate to prioritise vulnerable employees. So uh, there might be employees who have a particular vulnerability, not thinking so much of those who would be shielding and who would therefore um, al already perhaps be a, out of the workplace, perhaps availing of statutory sick pay, certainly anyone who had um, symptoms or in close contact with symptoms, thinking also of a individuals just outside that loop who may have um, caring responsibilities um, which make them more possibly susceptible um, to the risk of coronavirus. It's entirely legitimate to prioritise vulnerable employees. And helpfully, the system is flexible enough to allow the implementation of a furlough rota. Uh, the uh, scheme, uh, as people will know who've accessed it, uh, enables individuals to be placed on furlough at uh, periods of no less than three weeks. And that might well uh, deal with the situation where a, someone um, does not wish to be placed on furlough, uh, or alternatively, some do. Um, there are different considerations that, that apply depending on people's situations. Um, and uh, the use of the rota might be a way around that, might be a way of ensuring a degree of fairness uh, across the system. And also, um, it's a legitimate and permissible to look for volunteers if, that, if, that, if that's something that can be done. Now, again, um, designating an employee as furloughed uh, does amount to a variation of the person's contract of employment on a temporary basis. And uh, it will be known that the initial guidance that was issued by HMRC uh, initially said that, that all that really was required was that the employer designate the individual as furloughed and nothing more was required. Subsequent variations in the guidance, and there have been several, um, and some have caused confusion, but some indicated that there was actually a need for written evidence of consent. Now, again, that is not demanded currently under the HMRC scheme. However, leaving aside the detail of the scheme, from the point of view of employment law, since furloughing does constitute a temporary variation of one's contractual terms and conditions, it is, in my view, important that employers do secure uh, the consent of employees to being placed on furlough and that they record the evidence of that consent. As I say, HMRC merely designate that written evidence of the notification the agreement arrived at be retained for their purposes for five years. But beyond that, uh, to satisfy the requirements of employment law, which 
always required that any variation to an individual's contract be a, secured by way of consent, that that consent be retained. Um, so uh, moving on from that, um, a, the, what, what the employer, Ferdinand has referred to this uh, already in his uh, comprehensive uh, address earlier on. Um, the, a employ, uh, employees on furlough um, cannot provide service uh, to their employer, uh, nor can they engage in income generating work. Now, there have been uh, a few helpful clarifications to that. For example, employees engaged as employee representatives who may be participating in a redundancy consultation, they can render those services because they're not income generating in nature. Uh, and indeed that has confirmed the position, which I know a number of employers are faced with, which is that during the period of furlough, they are actually engaging in redundancy consultation. Uh, employers will know that depending on the size of the workforce and more pertinently, the number of persons who are likely to be made redundant, uh, the uh, consultation period varies and therefore some employers have found that uh, placing persons on furlough has enabled people to be retained in employment and enabled proper consultation about impending redundancies to take place. But uh, for those who are being placed on furlough uh, with the intent and expectation that they will come back into uh, the workforce at the end of the furlough scheme uh, on the 30th of June 2020 or whenever it's extended to as, as there's some speculation that it will be extended, um, they must not engage in remunerative work for their employer. They can take place, uh, take part in volunteer work. They can engage in training. Uh, and uh, again, as I think Sverdl has already mentioned, they can work for a different employer, provided that doesn't conflict with their existing contractual terms. Now, how does furlough interact with statutory sick pay? Well, um, if an employee is on sick leave uh, or self-isolating, then they uh, have an entitlement to statutory sick pay. They cannot come off statutory sick pay whilst they satisfy the, the criteria for uh, being on statutory sick pay uh, and, and come on to furlough, as it were. The two are mutually exclusive to that extent. If someone satisfies the conditions uh, for statutory sick pay, they remain on statutory sick pay. Once they come off that, once they're certified as fit, they could, depending on the circumstances, be placed on a, a, a on the furlough scheme. Um, similarly, in relation to statutory maternity pay, a, the other family a, leave a, a pay arrangements, a, employees will continue to avail of those until the relevant time period a, has been exhausted, and thereafter, a, if 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 a furlough remains an option and um, they're, they're an eligible employee, they, they may be placed on, on, on furlough. Now, a question uh, that initially wasn't uh, particularly well addressed in the guidance uh, and um, employers have been asking questions about it is how does the furlough scheme interact with holiday leave and pay? So holiday leave continues to accrue at the normal rate um, by employees who are placed on furlough and pro rata for part-time employees. After a, an initial period of uncertainty, it has now been made very clear that holiday pay is paid at the normal rate of pay. So a, if an employer, any employer of course has an entitlement to top up the 80% a furlough pay to 100%, that would be entirely um, a matter for the employer. But uh, for those employers who are um, paying um, furloughed workers at the 80% rate, then it's important to remember that uh, if an employee avails of annual leave during the period of furlough, then that is to be paid at the normal rate of pay. So there needs to be top up for that period. That would apply also to uh, in, uh, employees who uh, in, in companies where bank holidays, for example, are normally availed of. Uh, either the bank holiday is paid at 100% or the employee gets 
a, a holiday a, at a later time in lieu of that bank holiday. Now, uh, em employers um, are naturally concerned about a, a vast range of things, needless to say, but um, about the implications of, of a lots of folk being on furlough, then perhaps coming back into the workplace, how that will affect business needs if a annual leave has built up over the period of furlough, uh, how that will affect uh, the business's ability to uh, quickly uh, uh, get back to running on all cylinders. Employers do have a, a, a statutory entitlement to, uh, under the working time regulations, regulation 18 of the working time regulations, uh, 2016 that apply in Northern Ireland, to, um, hello? hello? It's all right, keep on going, uh, uh, Apologies. Um, to to, uh, to um, require employees to take holidays at a, a particular time. And the rule is that uh, if an employer wishes to, to require employees to take a, a holidays at a particular time, the employer must give the employee uh, the, the, twice the, the length of notice uh, as regards the period of holiday time the, the, uh, that, that, that is required to be taken. So if an employer wants a, a, an employee or employees to take five days holiday, they have to give 10 days notification of that. Above and beyond that statutory entitlement, an employer may have a contractual entitlement in the contract, uh, depending, on, de, de, depending on whether that does uh, exist there. Uh, the Labour Relations Agency guidance uh, in relation to this matter states very clearly that where, that, uh, where an employer intends to exercise that entitlement, it's important uh, to uh, discuss the situation with employees and to discuss any particular sensitivities uh, or issues that arise. And of course, that would underpin everything in this challenging and a uh, strange period that we're all uh, li living through um, that, that uh, underscoring everything, even the decision to, to designate people as furloughed, all of that as far as possible should be done on the basis of discussing uh, with employees so that any particular concerns can be uh, ad addressed. Now, uh, as well, um, a, it will, a, employers will know that um, a, in tandem to the situation a, a, across the water, regulations have been introduced in Northern Ireland to a, which provide temporarily for annual leave to be carried over for a period of two years a, subsequent a, to, the, to the current year to, to address that situation of um, build up uh, of, of annual leave on the one hand uh, from the employer's perspective and on the other hand from the employee's perspective that um, a, there, there, may, there may be very pressing reasons why they've not been able to avail of annual leave. It's a, the, the regulations speak of the inability to take annual leave being not reasonably practicable for a worker to take uh, leave as a result of the effects uh, of coronavirus. So that's another flexibility, if you like, that has been entered into the situation. The, um, the, the scheme itself runs until the 30th of June. And uh, as already uh, mentioned, employees can be rotated on and off during that period. Um, but what we, we are finding uh, now is that um, initially it, the, the, the big question for employers was, a, you, you know, whether to avail of the scheme and then a, a, who to select, a, who, to, who to place a, on furlough and, and whether to engage in, in rotation. Whether, um, now that furlough is up and running and um, many a, employers are availing of it. And with the a, apparent ending of the scheme on the 30th a, of June, subject, as I say, to any extension or modification, the scheme might come out in the meantime, um, employers' um, attention is focusing to the return of individuals from furlough back into uh, the workplace. 
Uh, again, great care must be taken. There should be no um, differentiation between a, a employees in terms of bringing the back off furlough, except as I have already referred to as regards business needs, legitimate objective considerations of that nature. But care must be taken that bringing people back off furlough doesn't result in any less favourable treatment on any of what are called the protected grounds, which are the grounds uh, for which it's unlawful to treat people differently, e.g. gender, age, disability, uh, something of that nature. And um, again, a, the, as I've mentioned, the furlough scheme itself can be and is being um, utilised uh, 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 by some employers who have determined that unfortunately redundancies will be an inevitability um, uh, if and when the scheme is discontinued. And whilst um, it is clear that redundancy consultation can take place during that, 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 that period of time, and as I've already uh, referred to, for example, employee representatives can engage in representative duties during that period, that would be no breach of the scheme. Um, it's important uh, to note that the scheme itself cannot be utilised to pay redundancy compensation, um, but, but it may be used, uh, as I say, as a facility to, to conduct the discussions. Um, so um, that, uh, I hope, is a, a, a reasonably quick skip through um, the furlough scheme, as we've all come to know uh, and love it. Um, I uh, apologise for the, um, the difficulty there with regard to my um, screens and I thank Caroline um, for her um, professionalism and getting it all back up online and very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Rosemary. Uh, I hope you'll agree with me that was time well spent, a lot of information and really insightful. Uh, again, I am going to ask all the panellists to come on camera and come on screen. We have a number of questions coming in. So on that note, uh, I'm very conscious of time, uh, so I'm going to wrap up the Q&A session there. Thank you so much for your time today, both to our speakers and to our panellists for their insights and their guidance. And I hope that the audience will agree with me, a lot to take away and a lot to mull over. The recording will be available, uh, so please feel free if you want to go visit the Intertreat Ireland website, you will be able to uh, access it there. I also want to thank those of you who have joined our event today. Uh, we hope that it's been of help to you and I know that Intertreat Ireland and any of the speakers would be more than happy to talk to you uh, uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, please don't forget this is the first of a three-part series. We're back tomorrow at the same time for financial supports uh, for Irish businesses and on Thursday and Friday next week for cash flow management and funding and then for our final part the week after that the Thursday and the Friday for planning for recovery. All the details along with registration uh, which is now open uh, can be found on Intertrade Ireland website. So really uh, all I can say now is thank you for joining us uh, and stay safe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.